Father, thank you. Thank you for all you provide for us and all the love and the music that touches our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, to start with grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to let you know that we received a letter from the child that we're sponsoring, which was pretty exciting when I got the mail. I'd like to read the letter to you from them, from him. My dear, how are you? I hope that you are good healthy. I am also fine. So sorry for a corona epidemic which hit the world. Dear, let's... <laughs> it, this is literal, and my brain isn't doing it the right way. Let's, me and you, unite together crying to God to save us from this pandemic. Please refer to the Bible, Ephesians 6, 14 through 17. And drawing, he has an apple that he drew for us. So I'm just going with the fact that we're all the apple of God's eye on that. <laughs> but it was just really exciting to get this. This is like Christmas in itself for us. So. And again, if you guys want any of the information to be able to write to him, let me know. I'll be happy to give it to you because it's recommended if you want to. By all means, feel free. Ah, oh, so that's a gift. <laughs> it's just that it's a gift of love for us to be able to have the opportunity to do that. And this just goes to show that God is working with us, making us grow because we're, he's responding to us through this child. Oh, it's so exciting. <laughs> so, are you aware that giving to the Lord is a privilege, not a job? You know, it is. God asks us to give to Him as a gentleman that He is, but it's a privilege. It's not something we have to do. It's not something we're paid to do. We are paid for what we do for the privilege to give back to God. A lot of people just don't quite follow that. But we need to be reminded of that often, just because that's how it works. He gives us everything just because. Because he loves us, not that he has to. He doesn't have to do any of that. The Old Testament, they had to earn every privilege and every gift they got. We are blessed and honestly spoiled. 2 Corinthians 8, 5-7. And they exceeded our expectations. Now, most of us have heard about this story where they were begging and pleading to be able to give. That's, it's beautiful because that's what we're needing to do in our world now to help each other. Please let me help you. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and that is step one. Have the Lord in you and give yourself to the Lord by Jesus as your Savior then you can move forward and your life will change so much incredibly beautifully wise. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, right there, in faith, that is a key phrase, two little words. You got the Lord in you, and you're using the Lord's faith that he put in you, growing it and showing it. When you speak, or in speech, when you talk to people about it, you're talking about the Lord and what he does and what you do for him. Knowledge. You read your Bible, you learn about it, you understand. You share it. You teach it. In complete earnestness and in the love best part, the love that we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. You can't really give without it coming from your heart. I mean, if you do it fine, you know, just to get them off my back, you're not giving them any good respects. You're better off keeping it because it's not going to do you any good. It's just going to make a number climb, but it may actually cause damage for some because it's dirty money, so to speak. So you do it from your heart. I mean, this was to go to the churches in Macedonia, but it was all from the heart, and that is just how it's to be. God tells us that from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation. His love is in us to share. So, Father, we thank you deeply for all the gifts you provide for us. 
we are a very giving group of people and we know that you have plans for us. We would not be here if it weren't for you. We thank you, Lord. We're not asking to just necessarily see what you can do or give us, but we're reaching to see your face, to show us your face for us to move forward as well with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, have you ever been tested? <laughs> That's really a silly question. <laughs> The tested is subjected to or qualified through testing. Okay. Now, how often do we test something? All the time. Anytime you buy something, a car, you got to take it for a test drive. I mean, you got to get that gas pedal and see how much power is in there. If it sets you back in the seat like a real powerful car is supposed to do, or if it just crawls along with what I call the, uh, I'll put it in the room now, uh, the GW, the gutless wonders. You can step on that baby and you're pedaling a car and it sounds like it's just going to go fast, but it's a glorified lawnmower sound. <laughs> it depends on what you're looking for. Either way, you got to test it. And if that's what you're looking for, that's what's meant for you. Simple as mattresses. When you go buy a mattress, you lay down on one. You want to see if it's you know comfortable, if it's too soft, too hard. They're not a cheap purchase, so you want to make sure you get the right thing. Shoes. Honestly, I do like shoes, but I gotta try them on first. Make sure they fit. If you've ever worn shoes that are too small, you don't make a habit of it. If they're too big, you look really sloppy clepping along, but it could be intentional fun. <laughs> you know? Clothes too, because you're the same size every time you go shopping. <laughs> so you change clothes size, styles, whatever, but you try them on. They can look really good or they can look not so good. Recipes are the same thing. Ever made something from the first time? All these different things you put into it and how you make it. And you taste it. You're testing it to see, well, I gotta taste it to see what it tastes like. And then you change it <laughs> because you want it to your tastes. That's a test. And then there's getting tested. Do you remember in school? <laughs> the teacher would say a test. My hands would break out in a sweat. I would practically hyperventilate. A test was a terrifying thing for me because I had it in my head that I was going to fail before I even saw the test. I've gotten better, but I still have that feeling on some things that just, my hands just get clammy thinking about it. I'm working on it. It's a slow process. How about your driver's test? Now, I really think that most people, when they take their driver's test, regardless of their age, are nervous because you've got this officer sitting there next to you. And they have it in their power to say yes or no. Now, this guy that I had with me, oh my gosh, I felt this big. He got in the car, he had to take off his hat, and I had a big car. I think I was driving an Impala. You know, the late 60s, early 70s, those are big cars. His head was that close to the roof. And I'm like, uh, I felt so little. I felt like I should be in the car seat. You know, it's like his size was intimidating for the test itself. <laughs> Very nice guy. He didn't say much because, you know, they're not supposed to distract you. And I'm thinking, I do better if I'm not distracted because you're not talking. But I passed, by the way. <laughs> you know, when you could take a job, some jobs when you go to interview, you actually take some tests just to see whatever they're looking for, how it qualifies you. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. You gotta try again. I had to try it twice. In most jobs, they have, you know, bigger companies, they have yearly evaluation things that you have to retake all these tests so that you're familiar with all the business protocols, the procedures, and, you know, there can be like, I don't know, eight of them, <laughs> something like that. But you got to be tested on these things. You get to keep taking it over and over again because you must pass. But you know, some people are like, aren't you done yet? It's like, sorry, it's a test, believe me. <laughs> you know, God tests us all the time. Every time you open your eyes, it's a test. But we know without a doubt, when we get tested by God, we never fail. We just get to do it over again. You're not criticized, you're not embarrassed, you're not shamed or ridiculed. You still haven't got that right? No. God's just mercy and blessings and love and gifts and 
Do it again, child. I love you. That's how we should treat all things. Amen. Yeah. No judgment. We are not the judge makers, but we sure like to do it. And I know every Sunday when I stand here, I'm being tested. And not just by God, but those who view it and whatever thoughts or comments. It's not that it's a criticism either. And it's not to try and make it appear that, you know, in that regard. But I am tested. I ask God every time I get up here, because without Him, it goes flat. There's no way. I ask him to use me as the vessel the way I am supposed to be used. Even though I trip over my tongue and I say things that come out backwards, that's because I'm human. And honestly, I can laugh at myself because I've had a lot of practice. But it's all a test. If you're going to say or do something, you're going to be tested. And I'm glad because that means we're growing. And when we're growing in the Lord, it's a positive. There's a lot song that we sang. That, was a, that song is kind of heart-wrenching because that was after Jeremy Camps' wife passed away. And he's saying, I still have faith. I still believe this was a test that you're taking me through, and I'm passing it, starting with the fingertips. That's a fabulous way to remember things. That's where worship songs really are impactful for people. If they pay attention to what's in it, understand what the song is when it's supposed to reach you, it's a test to see if you're paying attention, first of all, but it's telling you something. There's a real purpose to it. So it's no different than when you're studying the Bible. Pay attention to the words. There's a test to come if you're listening to it. So we're going to go through chapter 22 of Genesis. Poor Abraham. That man was tested like nobody else. <laughs> Bless his faithful heart. 22, 1 and 2. Sometime later, and I think this should really be phrased, once again, God tested Abraham because it was another test. But it does start with sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. And then God said, take your son, your only son, the one you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. I will show you. Now he's, like I said, he's been tested a lot. This test is just kind of crazy, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Only Abraham could pull this one off. <laughs> Perhaps Job. Yeah, I mean, he was always tested. You know, there was, he was told to leave home. No reason, no information, just God said, Abraham, go, leave. You got to get away from this. No doubt, he just got up and went. His wife technically was his half-sister, but when they had gone somewhere, he said to deny that you're my wife for safety. Well, there's a test. Fortunately, they all passed. The child. Now, technically, this is his second child. But that's not how it's being viewed by God because this is not the child that God, the other child was not the child that God gave him. He had to wait for the right child. But now, <laughs> sacrifice your only son. Does that sound familiar? Many years later, we heard that God was sacrificing his only son. I mean, this is already in Genesis when we're talking about sacrificing a son. And when and where? <laughs> in 22, 3 through 5, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood and burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. Not a question, not a doubt. Just pack it up, get it together, and let's go. You know? On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Okay, now, there's one phrase in there that honestly I didn't catch until yesterday when I was rereading it. But I mean, he's a true servant. You're doing what God's asking. But there's one sentence here that really shines out with his faith. We will worship and then we will come back to you. It's not a doubt. 
He knows what he's going up there to do. He also knows what's going to happen. He knows his son is okay already. He can't tell anybody. It's a secret with him and God. But we will be back. I don't know how many times I've seen that. And it never really registered until yesterday. And it's like, oh, super. It's like watching a mystery when you catch the real clue. There it is. You know, we also have to remember, when God has us do something, He does not give us more than we can handle. Not now, not ever. So when He does have you doing it and you're struggling, it's a test. You are being tested. And you'll take it over and over and over again. So, save yourself some time, some agony, some frustration. Just do it. Easy to say when you're not going through it without a doubt. Easy for me to say for somebody else to do it too. But it is how it is designed. So Genesis 6, uh, 22, 6 through 7. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. It just is so... It, it just doesn't sit right when you think about it. He's given him all the stuff to carry for his own sacrifice, <laughs> you know, but it's the way it was designed. As the two of them went up together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac asked, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Okay, now that's kind of registering, and I, tried, I looked up to see what <laughs> Isaac's age was. I went, I found anywhere from 4 to 32. Well, I don't foresee I, Abraham picking up a 32-year-old son and putting him up on these sticks either. So I'm sure he's a child simply because of the question. But Isaac, or Abraham's not the only one being tested here. Given the fact that Isaac is the supposed sacrifice, he's being tested as well with his father. He's noticing there's nothing there to put on the offering because, you know, they would have brought it with. So he's figuring things out. This is a very strong young man in faith as well as his father. And Abraham is strong in his faith and obedient. He's never denied doing something for the Lord. He's always done what he's been told. So 8 through 10. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, this part had to have been so hard for him, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Wow! I mean, the Lord watched his son die on the cross, but he is a God. We are human. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, do you have a visual of this? You have this altar. You have all this wood all laid out. You have literally tied up your son, put him up there, and you're about to take your son's life with the knife that he carried. It's crazy. It, it, it's just mind-boggling, but Abraham has not hesitated. He did not stop. It doesn't say that his son tried to get away and he had to tie him down and keep him there. It's not how it worked. God will provide the burnt offering. So just be still, pay attention, have strong faith. This is a test. Whenever something starts to get overpowering, remind yourself it's a test. And when something happens, <laughs> I'm guilty of it too, and I'm not proud of it, but I've gotten better. But like if you stub your toe or you smack your elbow, and instead of ouch, sometimes other things come through. It happens. Most people do. So I was thinking yesterday to make a mental change. It, it, it's going to take effort. It's, it's a test of faith for us. It's going to take effort. It's a work in progress, but I did do it this morning. Instead of whatever is the utterance you want to say, 
because I come across some or read or saw something, instead say, praise the Lord. You know how much faster things get fixed? <laughs> when you're standing there and your toe is just throbbing and you're, it's no. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, he gave me this. That was a test, by the way, to see how you react. It took me a, f <clears throat> a few decades to catch on to that one. <laughs> but it's something I'm asking everybody to try to remember and change it around. Instead of the grumbling and the agony, praise the Lord. Then the test is done and the pain is going faster away. <clears throat> so 11 through 25, or 15, excuse me. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Notice it doesn't imply that it was frantic or panicked or anything. The Lord does not move really fast in regard. He moves at his pace. It's, yeah, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Can you hear me? <laughs> it's like a casual conversation for him. Here I am, he replied. No panic, no fear, no worries. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord, right? That's what we're thinking. And Abraham already knew because he said, we will be back after we worship. Do not do anything to him. Now, I, I, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now, they use fear here, but it's another word for respect. You have me completely trusting in you and you and me. There's not a doubt. He never doubted it once. He won't. Because you respect and fear for me so deeply. Abraham looked up and there was the thicket, or in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its thorns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. You think maybe his son raced him over there to make sure he got it? <laughs> Because he knows it's not him, but let's get this thing moving. <laughs> you know, because that had been terrifying for a child of that age. But at the same time, he had as much faith as his father. Because he was not afraid either. So Abraham called that place, the, will, or the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. I would like to go to that mountain. I would really like to see it. Not for, you know, the greed of people wanting to be provided, but just, I mean, that is a spiritual place of the Lord. He was there. Our Father was there. And, well, He's everywhere, but it's demonstrated where He was with Him. But it was, the real burnt offering was provided. As Abraham said, the Lord will provide the burnt offering. 15 through 17. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your dependents as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand and the seashores. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. Now, that may be only a couple of verses, but there's a lot there. I mean, again, he's being spoken to from the Lord. But when the Lord says, I swear by myself, have you been to court any time where you've had to put your hand on your Bible and say, I swear to the Lord, hold the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Well, that's what God's doing here. He's swearing. He's claiming himself as I swear to myself. That's important because he does not lie to us. He only tells us the truth, and he's referring to himself in that regard to remind us, this is my word. It is true, declares the Lord. Now, years ago, Abraham had also been told about the same thing. Your dependence as numerous as the stars in the sky. Remember, he told him, go outside, look at the sky, see all those stars? Because he couldn't understand how he meant how many children he will have, or descendants. In the sand, he's being reminded again. 
and he just passed the test to prove. Now, I'm reminding you, this is what's going to happen. And it happened because the Lord said it would. But he went through how many tests at this point already? And this boy is not very old. But you have to remember, you have to take the test. In Job 23, 8 through 12. But if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. But he knows the way I take when, I have, when he has tested me. Now this man is aware of the tests. I will come forth as gold. My feet have closely followed steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Now when you're looking at, if I go east, he's not there. If I go west, I do not find. If he's at work in the north, I do not see. If he turns south, I catch no glimpse of him. He's seeking the Lord's faith. Face, excuse me. He's looking to see the Lord's face because he has seen it before. He wants to see it again. He wants to know that he's really there, but he knows he is. Mm -hmm. But don't we all want to see the Lord's face? I do. It's show me your face. And then I look around the room, by the way. I see him everywhere because he is in each and every one of us. So every smile, every glimmer, every giggle, I see the Lord. So when you ask to see the Lord's face, he's showing it to you in many ways. The Lord of his, the, the children of him. <clears throat> but he, when he tested me, I will come forth as gold. Now, that's cool because you're going to be so purified when you get through that test for that last thing you just did. You're getting closer and closer and stronger and better and more. Treasure the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. That is true desire for the Lord. You first, always first. I will go without everything. I don't even want my daily bread. You first, your face. You look for him. He will find you. He will show you. Don't give up. You can turn whatever direction you want and you'll find him. He'll find you as well. But Job's love for God was as deep as Abraham's, and he went through some serious tests as well. That pure as gold as God has made him. Psalm 66, 8 through 12. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. He tells us, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into a prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride all over our heads. We went through the fire and water, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Now, you were put, they were put someplace obviously not pleasant, it was prison. They were treated beyond awful. But the Psalms are so beautiful. Their music, I mean, they're songs of Psalms. Again, these are things that when we sing them, we read them, we hear them, we're supposed to pay attention. It's to tell us something. There was a test here for them. It's also for us, for us to pay attention to what the test is. I mean, when you're there, praise the Lord. Always make that your first thing. I'm learning to. I'm working on it. That should be the first thing. Any kind of test that comes your way, Oh, ow, ooh, bite the tongue, praise the Lord. It's going to take some work. I honestly believe that's how we're supposed to be doing this because the Lord is telling us that. He'll keep testing us. We'll keep trying. We'll keep getting better at it. But these cruel people, there was the fire. There was the water. But at the end, but you brought us to a place of abundance. You pass the test, he's telling you, go through all the things that I have lined. Just like in the song, the broken road is my path. Follow it. 
And in the end is the glory, the abundance. And then you start another test for more abundance and another test. You can't stand still with the Lord. Then you're just kind of sitting on the fence, you're comfortable, and you just, you're okay there. Well, that's not okay with God to just be okay there. He wants you better. He wants you brighter. He wants you bigger. He has plans for us, but for us to be able to get to these plans, we have to pass the tests. Plural. You will be tested repeatedly. And thank the Lord when you're done. At the beginning, praise you, Lord. At the end, praise you, Lord. Thank you. And we grow further. Proverbs 27, 21. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the people tested by their praise. And now, they use the silver and the gold. These were some of the most pure things that they had as an example. They refined it to this perfection. We are already refined to perfection. But this is the character tests in our health. It's to make sure that we don't get filled in our head that I am so much better. Because those tests are going to be a lot harder if you start thinking yourself above others. There is a test set up for you, but don't tell God to make it a bigger one because it's tougher. So I, I preach the word, so I am a servant of God, thank you very much, is what I am. I am not a hotty toddy and I am not better than anybody. My job is to be, honestly, in my book, beneath. Because, just like Jesus, I'm a servant to help others. I'm not better. I don't want to ever have that thinking. And I do believe I have friends and family that if I get that thinking, they will not hesitate to tell me. So, I'm reassured that God has got that test taken care of and under control for me. <laughs> oh, Father, thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you for the word that you always make sure we understand. If we ever have a doubt or feel that we need it, make sure it gets into us deeply and loudly. Amen.